everyone. Uh, nice to see you all. Welcome to our incredible panel uh, talking all about product-led growth uh, concept in times of uncertainty. My name is Elena Verna. I'll be your moderator today. I'm a growth advisor for Miro. I'm a Reforge EIR as well as growth advisor to many incredible companies like MongoDB or OutSystems. And today I have an incredible set of people with me to have a really lively discussion on it. Just a reminder, the session is going to be recorded and posted uh, later on, uh, probably early next week. So it will be available to rewatch in case you have to drop out or you are missing it. And then uh, this is also the last live stage event for today. So afterwards, there's going to be some network uh, and activities. But this is the last live session on the main stage. But let's dive right in. Product-led growth, it's the hype of the Silicon Valley. What is it all about? What does that actually mean? Do you need product-led product managers now that you need to hire on your team or not? We'll talk about it all. Uh, please submit your questions on Slido as we're starting to discussion. But before we get into some of the questions that I have prepared for our panelists, I would like to introduce them. So Vicky, can you please uh, tell us a little bit uh, about yourself, uh, how, where you are and how you got here? Yeah, absolutely. So hi, everybody. I am Vicki Wolbowski. I'm the head of product at Zapier. If you don't know Zapier, we're an online automation tool that um, lets you connect all your favorite apps, things like Gmail, Slack, MailChimp, um, and about 2,000 more, um, and let you automate work. Um, I've been at Zapier for about five years. Before that, I started my uh, career in healthcare IT and kind of worked through uh, uh, that enterprise world, uh, then started my own small business helping uh, small businesses just figure out how to be more productive and effective and actually discovered Zapier as a tool to solve a lot of those uh, my clients' problems. Uh, and yeah, here I am today. It's nice to meet everybody. Amazing, I love Zapier. Carlos, can you introduce yourself and tell us uh, what you do and how you got here? Hey everyone, my name is Carlos. My last name is very complicated, so I, think, I hope you can read it. I'm the founder and CEO of Product School. And I started this company six years ago because it's a solution to my own problem. I come from an engineering background. Nobody told me anything about product or business, so I decided to go to business school. But then I realized that in business school, nobody was teaching me anything about product either. So I finally created a place where people can actually focus on, on growing their product careers, either to get their first jobs or to get their next promotion. And we are very proud to build an entire community with over 1 million members around the world where we also put out uh, resources, books, best practices, templates, and in general, education to allow people build better products. That's amazing. Thank you, Carlos. And Hitan, can you introduce yourself? Uh, what do you do and how you got here? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Hitan Shah, and uh, I'm currently co-founder and CEO of FYI. Uh, how I got here, it actually started when I was five years old. And I think I'm going to go through the whole story and take up all of our time, right? Uh, but no, it started when I was five years old. My dad told me I should be an entrepreneur and never work for anyone. Uh, I've only had an internship uh, in my life, and I've just built software businesses uh, and, and other types of businesses prior to that. And so I've been building software for 15 years. I've also invested or advised about 150 companies now. And I just enjoy talking about this stuff and building. That, that's me. And the current product I'm working on, FYI, helps you find documents across all the different sort of uh, document apps that you use today. It's an amazing solution. Um, I definitely use it because Google Doc has become a, well, Google, just Google Drive has become the Neverland that I can never find anything at anymore. Anyway, so let's get going. Uh, my name, as I said, is Elena Vernon. I've been in the product-led growth companies, or that's how you could char characterize them for my entire life. I spent eight years at SurveyMonkey, where I ran their data and, uh, and then growth teams that were consisted of the marketing, uh, product, and analytics teams. Then I was at the company Malware. Bytes, uh, where it's a cybersecurity company where I ran their consumer business. I had a chance of actually working for Nero for a while. I was their interim CMO, and now I'm just doing a growth advice 
amazing for incredible businesses. But product-led growth concept is always on my mind. So what is product-led? I think there's a lot of confusion about what is uh, viral loops, what is virality, what is product-led, what is marketing-led, what is it all about? So I want to actually open it up of actually sharing definitions first of what is the product-led mean to you? Is it a hype? Is it a real thing? Is it going to go away? Is it here to stay? Do we really need to know about it? And how do you actually define it for yourself? And Vicky, I would love to start with you. Yeah, spicy question. We were debating this a bit uh, in, before we got on the panel. So I'll give my answer and we'll see uh, wh where we all land. So to me, a product led company is one that really minimizes friction to get the product in the hands of their target customer. And then they use those customers to get uh, to the next get the next user in their product. So for that first customer, um, you know, it's all about finding the right channels to get in front of them pitching them on how you can solve their problems and then letting them into your product, letting them use it, letting them or actually delivering on that value that you promised them. Um, and then that customer can help you shortcut the loop for the next one. They can actually sell it to your next customer and bring them in and they can do it in a much more personalized way than you could do yourself through those original channels. So that's kind of how I think about product led growth. And I think it's a mindset that not just product managers need to have, but it, it kind of has to be through the whole organization. Work for the entire company as opposed to necessarily a tool for product managers. But uh, Carlos, what do you think? I agree. I think growth is a team sport that uh, traditionally was assigned to marketing, but uh, now we're seeing that a product can contribute to growth and not just product, customer success, sales, operations. Everyone needs to understand the product that we are selling and, and, and help drive growth. And, Couple of like my definition, like super simple is using product as a channel, as your internal channel. Like traditionally, if you look at marketing, we rely on a lot of external channels, like ads, emails, social media, whatever, but using your own product to drive growth, I think it's very powerful. And I'm not just talking about growth as in terms of top of the funnel, just new sign ups. For me, growth is end to end experience. It's really making sure that when someone actually signs up, they get to that aha moment as fast as possible, and then also as often as possible. Absolutely. Hidden? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give a, a little bit more of a management cultural sort of response. Uh, there's sales-led businesses, there's marketing-led businesses, there's product-led businesses, there's finance-led businesses. There's, there's basically a almost a cultural imperative when you think about how a business is run. And, and this concept of product-led to me really means, especially when you talk about it from the perspective of product-led growth, it really means that you're thinking about as many things as in the business as possible with a product mindset. And a product mindset tends to be feedback oriented, super iterative, um, and very, very focused on sort of, uh, if you want to call it feedback loops, but also kind of behavior loops inside of sort of the product itself. So just like you know, the other folks said, I wish I could disagree, but at the end of the day, it's a mindset that gets spread across the whole company if you're really committed to it. And that's what I'm excited to see happen more and more as we've been talking about this and kind of it's becoming a thing. Do you think that there is, and I'm going to pick on you just one more uh, for one more question. Do you think that uh, product led strategy as a growth framework is right for every company or some companies have to be sales led or marketing led in order for them to be successful? We used to think that enterprise focused companies couldn't have free plans. Now, if you look at one of the biggest enterprise IPOs that's ever happened, I think the biggest uh, with Snowflake, you can go to snowflake.com, I think it's .com and sign up and, and use it for free. And so the reason I, I kind of gave you an offshoot answer is because, yeah, absolutely. Like, like we should be open to like having any company entertain product led growth, because if Snowflake as an enterprise company can essentially have a free plan when we thought enterprise companies aren't allowed to have free plans, then I think all these things are up in the air. I mean, this is one of the exciting things about what we're doing today. It's like, yeah, of course, like, yeah, I mean, why not? Why, why can't an insurance company do it? That's the way I think about it. Yeah, because a product led yeah. growth company in many ways, it's highly focused on the user, right? It's the customer that actually comes first and the solution that your product actually resolves for them. So they have a pain point, they need a solution. Are you actually providing a solution with your product, not just with your marketing, not just with the white papers, not just with uh, selling to 
do a checkbox on somewhere on the enterprise list, but an actual solution and the pain point for the customer. And it's interesting to me, I hear marketing teams so often complain about saturation of their marketing channels and that they need additional channels. And the product-led channel where you have your users actually do majority of the growth for your product fundamentally gets to the core point of that is your channel for growth. Your users are your growth, not necessarily Google or AdWords or YouTube or Facebook or Twitter. Those are great augmentations to the strategy, but they're not what is actually driving growth in your product. And that's another interesting thing that I actually think that a lot of product-led growth uh, companies are disrupting sales-led growth companies or marketing-led growth companies because they came out of nowhere because they actually drive through user adoption as opposed to a top-down enterprise buying motion. And then they just show up in the organization and organization is caught completely off guard and then they have to buy it anyways. Do you guys have seen that in any um, of the companies that you're working at where this disruption is really happening and because it's product-led? Yes, Carlos. Yes, I can't wait to answer that one because uh, we, we train a lot of uh, companies and uh, some of them are actually not high-tech companies in Silicon Valley. And some of these concepts are now starting to crystallize there. And I think there are, there's like a misconception uh, we usually get, which is, okay, if we are product-led, does it mean that we don't need a sales team or when does the sales team have to interact, right? And, and I think being product-led or applying this mindset is complementary to other good practices that we've been learning throughout the years, such as Good design is important, and this is not just a B2C thing. Like design is important for B2B. Or now what we're talking about with the Snowflake example, or like having a free tier is not just for a B2C product. It can be for enterprise and it's perfectly valid. So here, I'm not trying to replace sales. What we are trying to do is to better qualify our users. So when sales interacts with, with those users, they're in a much better position to convert into customers or the other way around is sometimes you don't need to talk to sales, especially for certain tiers. And it obviously gets to a point where if the package is big enough and requires a certain level of customization, absolutely. But like the most successful product-led companies that I've seen, they know how to, how to master the product qualification of those leads with the sales team. Uh, Vicky, Zapier is such a perfect example of just showing up in the company. I've seen so many examples where just developers all of a sudden start using it without any approvals, without any um, anybody even knowing that what's happening until it's too late. Can you tell us, was this the overall and original strategy of Zapier to target developers and go, uh, go sneak in into the companies like that? Or was it something that was, um, and how have you evolved it potentially? Yeah, yeah, it was definitely part of the, the original strategy. And it's very true in how we see kind of uh, Zapier be adopted within small organizations or within, you know, large organizations. Um, what's interesting about Zapier is that, you know, it's kind of a Swiss army knife, you can use it to do so many different things. And so usually what will happen is that the, you know, one person is trying to find the solution to a very specific problem, they find it was Zapier, they uh, then kind of learn what else Zapier can do and start kind of expanding their usage. And um, that is typically how we see it grow within organizations. And we just actually recently released uh, uh, and the ability to actually share Zaps, so Zapier build within Zapier to connect to apps. And we just recently released a feature to do that. And what we're seeing is things that people are sharing are actually things that we market and talk about, uh, you know, in our, in our other marketing channels, but that personal connection, that ability to say, Hey, I use this, um, this solves a problem for me. And you and I have some sort of relationship or I'm some sort of, you know, industry there, um, that that actually has, you know, we're seeing really great activation and users come in and get really great value from the product in a way that our, you know, traditional channels just haven't been able to, to necessarily match. So uh, it's definitely something we're seeing more and more of and we're leaning into more and more at Zapier. Absolutely. So guys, tell me, do you think that uh, enterprise only sales company, so sales only company, let me step back. There are self-serve channels of sales where customers are just buying themselves using credit card, just purchasing online, and there's sales assisted, where you have a sales team that is actually helping customer close the sales. This product let go company, does it have to have self-serve? Is that a prerequisite so it goes into bottoms up? Or do you know that there's examples of enterprise only sales led companies that are bottoms up and have PLG motion as well? And does that work? Any thoughts? Yeah, I'll I'll add some thoughts on that. I think we're still defining what it is. 
So first of all, we're still defining what it is. So so it's hard to say, hey, this is it and this is not. I think the fundamental thing underneath a lot of the sort of talk about product-led growth and how to make it work in an organization, there's two fundamental things. One is it has to be things that people are already doing or wanting to do naturally. Uh, so people were already sharing zaps. If they weren't already sharing zaps somehow, whether it's just word of mouth, hey, I use this zap, or here's a combination I did, or can I screen share with you and show you how I built it so you can build it too? If they weren't doing that, that move would not make any sense and it probably wouldn't work for getting growth. But because they were doing that, you're able to align with this behavior and just make it easier for them. So in enterprise, I think there's actually tons of hidden opportunity that we are not capitalizing on if we don't put this lens on it. Because there are these behaviors in between companies happening, there's sharing happening of all kinds, even in enterprise use cases and enter enterprises. In fact, there might be even more happening there. We just haven't pulled it out and said, hey, we can make this easier. We can make it more efficient. But it has to be something that's like in line with what the customer already wants to do and what they're already doing ideally. So that's one piece of it. I think the second piece is a company has to commit to it or it's not gonna work. And it's one of those, one of those types of things. And what I mean by that is, if your sales team is used to channels that get them leads really fast, qualified leads, leads that are ready to buy, and then all of a sudden you introduce this channel and it's product-led growth, which is very different. Oftentimes people are not ready to buy until they've self-service used it and tried the thing out and hit certain points. And then you start contacting them or helping them use the product more. And the mindset shift is much different than an enterprise field sales operation compared to a product-led growth, even when you're doing sales with it, because the customer, is, their own mindset's different. They're not necessarily ready to buy until they're ready to buy. And it's your job to identify that. And that takes a lot of commitment across the org. And I've seen dozens of companies try and not all of them actually get there. And the big fundamental difference is just how committed they are to it across the company. Absolutely. So I think that there is, when you're talking about product-led, so we're deficited as we actually relying on our users to drive the growth of our company. They're doing acquisition for us. They're doing monetization for us because our product actually solves the problem so well. And they're retaining uh, in, in as much of the product-led fashion as possible, where product itself is solving their problems. I think the combination of self-serve and sales-assisted channels is the way of the future for us. I think sales-assisted is not going anywhere away as much as maybe I would love for it to reduce and for us to produce more self-serve transactions where we can be deciding what we want to do. But fundamentally, I think product-led enables, it, it works best when you land with self-serve, you expand with enterprise, but you still do some top-down enterprise buyer-only motion because some organizations are just going to buy that way. So no matter what your growth strategy is, you still have to surface channels to customers that they actually want to transact with. So the way that they're interacting with your product doesn't change. It's just who is actually a driver for your growth framework changes. It's not the budget. It's not your sales team doing outbound. It's the product itself that drives evangelization, word of mouth, virality within your, uh, within your ecosystem to drive additional usage, to drive additional acquisition, to expand and drive monetization at the same time. Well, I want to get back to the product level led um, as a concept. And Carlos, I want to pick on you. So you said that the element of being product-led company is to create a culture where everyone is a product manager. What does that mean? Yes. So I would say everyone has to adopt a product mindset. Everyone has to understand the product that the company is selling independently of the title that you have. So Product, obviously, it's a very important internal channel to drive that growth. And I think what's another another point that uh, um, he didn't make before is that this has to be supported at some point by someone in leadership. Like, has, Otherwise, it's just not going to work. So not all the companies have CEOs that come from a product background or even have their title chief product officer. But And that's okay. I think what's, what's happening now in the product world is that product managers or product leaders are becoming more of facilitators. They are trying to kind of create an environment where people can co-create. And I'm okay with all these uh, new trends, product-led, agile, lean. For me, it's all good as, as long as the team that is going to actually work on it believes in it and is part of the co-creation process. So in particular, I see two major themes uh, 
now that we are all working remote and we all want to be more product driven. One is uh, synchronous communication. Showing up to a Zoom video call doesn't cut it anymore. So meetings are becoming more like working sessions and the product managers or in general, the managers are becoming facilitators that are using that time for people to co-create and be part of it. So using tools such as Miro, it's very important because you feel like you are creating something and not just receiving information and maybe taking notes on a notepad. And then the second piece to it for me is asynchronous communication. So what happens when we are not working at the exact same time zone? And again, sending an email or sending Slack message doesn't cut it anymore. I think it's also very important to rely not only on whiteboards, but also other tools. I, I love using Loom, for example, to send video messages to people to somehow express, not just with words, my emotions. Because at the end of the day, we need to take advantage of every single interaction to make sure that people feel connected. And I think leaders need to take responsibility and kind of facilitate an environment instead of imposing or micromanaging the tools or the processes that everyone has to follow. So should marketers be product managers too? Everyone should understand the product. I think uh, the same way everyone should understand a little bit of sales or a little bit of support. I think the more you know in general about the end-to-end -end process, the better it will be for the organization to grow. Vicky, as a product lead in Zapier, uh, Zapier what do you think about um, the frameworks that you use as a product manager every single day that you drive for your team that you wish the rest of the organization would actually adopt or you push the rest of the organization to adopt yeah it's a great question i think probably the most powerful shift we made over the course of the last couple of years at zapier is to you know roadmaps. what's on the roadmap is a common question that the pms might get and um one of the kind of frameworks we took is to not roadmap on features, not like, hey, we're going to build X, we're going to build Y, but to roadmap on customer problems that we're going to solve. Um, and that's a real kind of like mentality shift that we push throughout our product org and we've seen move out to other parts of the organization as well is let's start by really deeply understanding the customer problem and the opportunity in the market. And um, before you know, and then once we feel like we've got our arms around that, let's really diverge on what our potential solutions that could solve that problem or go after that opportunity. Because at that stage, those things are cheap. Um, and you know, we might it might be something like throwing up uh, like a Figma prototype. It might be actually building something in code. It might just be working through some rough sketches uh, on what those things might be before we actually diverge and say, here's what we're going to build. Um, and again, doing that at the roadmap level to say that these are the problems we're committed to solving has really helped get too honed in on one specific feature or one specific solution before we've really done that exploration. Um, and I think bringing in folks from marketing, bringing in folks from support, like those people can be really great inputs to helping you understand the customer problem and being part of that ideation stage. And so um, we're continuing to push that. And I think it's a, it's a really good framework and mindset to, to have in a product org. I also find that every single product manager really has four swim lanes that they prioritize their efforts in. Number one swim lane is usually feature development. You're developing additional features for the core customer that you're already surfacing. And that's a very important one to continuously neutralizing your competition or potentially provide innovative solutions for your customers. The second swim lane is usually growth swim lane where you're optimizing what's already been developed. Just because you developed it doesn't mean it has an optimal way to actually hit the market. So you want to opt do optimizations to make sure that all of the adjacent personas and your core personas are going through the flow in the best way possible. The third swim lane is scale. You actually need to think of how can you automate yourself out of the job? How can you automate the, the uh, or how can you scale the platform, the infrastructure for you to be able to, um, to feed the ongoing growth that is happening in the company? And the third one is in the, sorry, the fourth one is innovation because you need to have the view on the second horizon. You need to know the strategy and where you're company is going so nobody's going to disrupt you and product managers do an incredible job of prioritizing feature development optimization scale work or innovation work 
the rest of the organization often just gets caught into initiatives. They're just, they're just doing feature work, so to speak, only, or they're only doing growth and optimization work. And they're not thinking about scale. They're not thinking about innovation. So how is it that you actually growing with the company? How are you supporting the, uh, the scale? How are you innovating on what you're doing? So make sure to adopt some of those mindsets in terms of put the customer first, know the solution first, and make sure that you actually prioritize your work across all of those different swim lanes, just like product managers do. So you scale yourself, you scale the organization, you scale your team, you scale your department, and you're constantly innovating and staying on top of the market as much as possible. I actually have a really good question uh, that is coming in, in our Slido. Thank you guys for adding them that I want to hit you guys up with right now because I think this is a very relevant time. And that is, what is the difference between being product-led versus customer-led? And is there a difference? Does anybody want to take it? I'm just going to say no. I, I don't think there's a difference no. at all. Product and customer is synonymous to me. Um, I mean, if you even think about what what Carlos Vicky and, and you have been saying, everything goes back to the customer. And so if you're building product, who are you building for if you're not building for the customer? So to me, product and customer are the same thing. If you're customer led, you're essentially product led because your product people tend to be thinking about the customer all the time if they're any good at it. And to Vicky's point, the roadmap wasn't about features anymore. It was about customer problems. And I think that's like a very kind of even at Zapier's scale. By the way, Zapier makes you happier. Just want to throw that out there so that everyone kind of knows how to say it. Uh, and I'm not affiliated anyway. Uh, but anyway, um, th 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 that stuff works because they're customer centric. And even at their scale and as the product org is evolving, they had to make changes to double down on that and, and take it away from the feature roadmap and take it to the problem roadmap. And, and I love that concept. I think to me, it is the same thing. You can't build product without having customer not even at the front front back left right of everything and be able to advocate for them across the team and that's even what carlos was saying on like product managers i think i think it's just a product product mindset and that goes back to culturally is your company focused on the customer is your company thinking like a product team because that's what we have left now when all the channels and everything else are kind of getting saturated daily and new ones not coming out fast enough. I remember the days when we had new marketing channels like every day, that's not the case now. Uh, I can't go get a lot of traffic from dig.com. Product Hunt is not working as well as it used to and all the traditional channels, everyone's figuring them out. I mean, just look at Instagram and all the ads there. So um, I, I see an ad for a new startup like every day on Instagram these days and it's some new SaaS tool because apparently I keep clicking on them. and. That's the only way we can survive is by being customer centric and, and customer led, so to speak. That, that would be my take. Yeah, I agree because uh, if you have a product market fit, there is some value exchange that is happening between that you give to your customer and you are able to monetize that value exchange by producing revenue and really funding your operations. So if you don't put customer first, you fundamentally may not only either not have product market fit, but you'll not be able to scale and uh, capture bigger markets or to actually find a uh, product market fit for the innovation that you're doing. But it's interesting to me that does that mean that the marketing led companies or sales led companies are not customer led companies? Um, I'm going to say no to that as well. I, I don't think, I, I, I think the best sales led companies and the best marketing led companies are super customer centric. And, and the reason for that is they wouldn't be able to do what they do unless they were. If you just think about all the things that uh, marketers and salespeople have to do, um, they might not be building and be responsible for building the product, but they're completely responsible for being able to describe the value of the product to people. Sales needs to do that and marketing needs to do that. And that has a fully customer centric activity. I agree with that. Um, yeah. yeah, I agree with that because I think being customer focused is not really that new and it doesn't really matter what is the culture of your company. First, you need to have a, a product that works, right? And you really need to care about your customers. And then you can decide how you want to grow your company. Are you going to grow it by hiring a bunch of salespeople and hitting the phone? Are you going to grow by investing a lot of money on different external channels? Are you going to grow by investing in adoption through certain features on your product? Like that is a different question than do you really care about your customer? 
Absolutely. It's all about the channels of growth and just viewing your product as a channel for growth, as opposed to really stepping away and saying, I'm not customer centric. I don't think any company can really succeed without being customer centric. It's just how do you actually define the channels for your growth. That's what fundamentally that the, the question comes down to. I also have another great question uh, on Slido as what are the main people skills to build a product led company? Like are there different people skills or different types of roles, different departments that you have to stand up? Do you think about let's say sales led versus marketing led versus product led, that there's different in the infrastructure of the team that has to uh, actually drive that growth? And Carlos, I see you're, you, you're you're uh, bobbing your head. Can you uh, can you share your thoughts? Uh, yes. Well, there was a very amazing article by Lenny on his newsletter on like different examples of companies that are marketing led, sales led, product led. For me, I think the culture of the founder really influences the culture of the company. If you come from a product background, by default, you are going to tend to surround yourself yourself by other people who care about product. If you are extremely sales driven, then maybe your product is less relevant. So. I think a critical point for any company that is trying not to be a startup anymore is to really detach the culture of the founder from the culture of the actual organization. And the only way you can actually influence that the company becomes product led, assuming that the founder is not product led, is by truly treating product with respect. I think product traditionally has been part of marketing orgs reporting to a CMO or parts of technology orgs reporting to a CTO. Now we are seeing more companies that have a chief product officer and that chief product officer reports to CEO. So I think that's a really good sign from the top that you care about product. Vicky, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think I agree with what Carl said. When I think the the way you phrased the question around, you know, what makes people successful in a product, what sort of traits make people successful in a product led company, um, one of the first things that came to mind is curiosity, right? Like I think deeply understanding costs a lot about asking asking for more, asking why, and digging deeper into understanding what are those customers' needs and motivations and how do you build a solution that really gets at them. Now, that's not to say that, you know, curiosity and that drive is an important styles of organizations, but I think particularly to be successful in a product-led organization, you have to have that, like, constant itch to dig in and understand why and ask the next question and question your assumptions and um, be curious to test hypotheses and be curious to you know, to be, be open to failing often, right? And getting it wrong and then trying, learning something new and trying again. And that like iterative mindset, I think is um, really sets people up to, to thrive in that kind of organization. And that's what fundamentally what a lot of growth teams bring into the organization, where they evangelize that mindset of iteration, of scientific method, of experimentation. Because if you have a team that is very traditional in structure, where they're just building or they're marketing or they're selling, growth team can come in and evangelize some of those curiosity uh, measures across the company and really pressure test some of the hypotheses that a team are doing and, and bridge the perception and reality um, gap that usually is created, especially as the, as the product um, is scaling. So growth team is in the way, to me, is a band-aid to the problem. Ideally, the core teams and product and marketing and sales and customer support are actually driving it. But it is helpful sometimes to have that evangelizer that is marching around and saying, let's test this, let's pressure test this, that really stands up that mindset in the company. But you cannot ever really expect growth team to only be responsible for growth in your company. It's really, it's an evangelizing function that does exactly what Vicky just said. Well, Hinton, I want to ask you a question, um, and that is you have a very interesting uh, view of the products need to be proactively, not reactively. There's so many times that we'll say the customer led, understand the pain points, build the product to solve those pain points. What do you mean by proactively versus reactively? And how do you understand what proactive pr product that you need to build for your customers? Yeah. It for me, this concept of proactive and reactive kind of fits in with sort of your concept of the different types of work. I think um, to me, reactive work is when you are getting prompted from the market, the customer, the support tickets, the volume that's coming in, whatever's coming in, and you're taking that and then creating uh, initiatives in your pro on your product team uh, with it. So that to me is very reactive. Historically, you can 
get away with being reactive uh, and, and actually make a product better. Um, what's happened now, I believe, is when you're reactive, you're focusing a lot on what customers want, but you might miss out on some critical things that they actually need that a competitor co could come in potentially and discover it and do a better job than you. And that's what I, that, that, that's kind of what I, what I mean by the difference. And so when it comes to proactive work, product work, it's more on the thinking and the mindset that we've been talking about where it's like, okay, we believe there's an opportunity for product led growth in our company. That would be an example of how you think through this. And then you go out proactively and go discover the opportunity. So it's more of opportunity discovery, um, sometimes you can use sales to do it. So sales discovery. So I, I would say a proactive approach is discovery first. A reactive approach is sort of inputs first or customer support first. Uh, we call them inputs in my company. So these are customer inputs basically. Uh, and there's lots of them. Uh, and, and it could even be because that's what customers are kind of uh, working with and looking at uh, as well. So that, that, that's the difference to me. And I believe we're in a world where you need to figure out what people need. And that that is usually a proactive job, not a reactive one. In the world um, earlier this year, when we got hit by COVID, I think a lot of people went into reactive uh, solutioning of how to actually address it. Do you guys have any yes. examples of where you think has gone well or the, where people or the companies uh, pivoted very well or people, companies that actually proactively decided to solve the problem? Any real life examples of how to actually think about being proactive versus reactive? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I can I speak can to that. what we saw. Uh, oh. No, Sorry, Vicky, go ahead, please, Vicky. please go ahead. Sure, I, I can I can speak to what we saw from our customers themselves. So um, when COVID hit, uh, you know, small businesses who make up a majority of our user base, they had to really quickly learn how to take their businesses online. And these aren't even tech, or most of them were not tech companies. So. Um, and, you know, they had to do it in a matter of days. They didn't have the luxury of having weeks or months to make some of these changes. Um, and for many, they're using a variety of new variety of digital tools and figuring out how to make them work together, which is kind of where Zapier fit in. So um, like an, an example that we saw in our user base was um, a coffee shop out of call when stay at home orders went into place. They they had to close their locations and they had to shift to an e-commerce shop to sell their coffee beans and they sold them worldwide, right? And so they use tools like Shopify, like MailChimp, like Google Sheets to really piece together that uh, customer lead all the way through to sales and delivery funnel. Um, they use Zapier to connect it all together. And I think they were able to get that e-commerce site up and running in about a day because they kind of took that mindset. Um, and we actually saw this happening across a lot of our, our customer base. When we looked at the data, um, we saw like the things that were trending, which apps people were using. And um, we use that as a lens for how to improve our product to better serve them. Um, and you know, we also saw some other interesting trends in the data. For example, there was this huge spike in new users that were trying to integrate uh, Spotify and Zoom. And on paper, it looked like, oh my God, there's this huge job trending, like we should dig into this, we should understand what problem those users are trying to solve. And when we did, we learned that, you know, people found Zapier because it integrates apps together and they wanted to stream some of their favorite, you know, Spotify music hour call uh, with family and friends. And as much as I love the concept of that, and I also like, you know, to listen to a good jam when I'm on, on a call with my friends, uh, they just didn't fit Zapier's core mission. And so that was one where we said, okay, we see this trend, like we could pivot and react to it, but it just didn't make sense to take folks off our existing roadmap who were helping customers like that coffee shop make sure that they got value from Zapier. Uh, and so we said no to opportunities like that. Did you end up introducing any new use cases as a reaction to what happened uh, globally, or did you stay course and double down on uh, existing use cases that your product was supporting? Yeah, so we improved current use cases. We made them easier. We really, you know, things that took workarounds in Zapier to do when we saw that, wow, small businesses are really, um, you know, really need this and they need it fast in a way that they're not necessarily, like in the past, we're gonna maybe spend time to figure it out and get that workaround. Like we really zoned in on those and figured out how to make that 
uh, much smoother for users so that they could get to success faster. Um, we paid attention to the other things that were trending, but I would say for majority, we didn't really shift too much from our core use cases, but we did make sure that we were addressing things that just could be better for customers with those core use cases. Very interesting. Carlos? Yeah, so for us, we were delivering all of our trainings, both in person and online when uh, COVID hit. And it was an opportunity to really reshape our strategy and think about the future. I think we were very reactive to Hidden's point, kind of like living from quarter to quarter. And when we had to stop for a second and think about, okay, how long is it going to last? We don't know. So we really need to rethink everything. And what I told my team is that this is an opportunity not to think about online as the second best option, but as a new option. Because like just tweaking what you have and try to convince the market that, hey, everything is great because now you can work from the home comfort of your home. You know, it's just not honest. And if you truly can remove those mental barriers and, and try to reinvent yourself while obviously implementing some tactics to stay alive, I think that's something that helped us. So in our case, we decided to shut down all the in-person locations, focus on online and not come back. And the way we did it was not by saying, well, and now everything is on Zoom. No, it's literally trying to take an online first approach and see what are some of the opportunities that we have now that people are online, such as using whiteboards, such as creating breakout rooms, like things that maybe weren't possible offline. And I think that's a very important distinction because if we just copy paste a template and try to sell people that are online is better than offline, that is just not true for all these cases. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, to bring it back to Mira, I'm sure you guys have seen the big uh, announcements about the workshop solutions. And that was Miro's, uh, they actually pivoted and the they have vertical use cases that they're solving for, such as brainstorming, ideation, mapping and diagramming. And then they created this workshops and meetings use case, which was a reactive in some way to the situation of us going all remotely, but it was proactive rethinking of how do we effectively run workshops and meetings online and being proactive about innovation that is being done. So you might be yanked, I would say, reactively to think about something strategically, but never solve the problem reactively. Always understand how you can innovate. I was in an interview with a product marketer not so long ago, and she said the biggest surprise uh, in messaging that they were, were doing for COVID um, to appeal to the user base to drive the business was that people did not care for them to solve their problem right now. Everybody still wanted an aspirational problem solve. Everybody still wanted to be better than what it is right now. So people fundamentally, most of the customers, they don't care for you to just fix today for them. But you want them to be better all, all, uh, all the way in the future. So doing that proactive look of what the future actually problems are going to be and how you can help them to jump ahead and solve the future problems is extremely important. Uh, the next question that I actually have for all of you guys, if anybody has any thoughts on it is, is it possible to be too product focused? So can you actually balance? Is there a balance between business growth and the product focus? Or is if you focus on product and you really do all of your check and boxes in terms of how to be an excellent product manager, the growth will come? I would, I would say that I've Kitten? seen it in myself. I would just say that I've seen it in myself and other people of being to product minded. And I don't think it's just about doing these set of things and then, hey, everything works out. I think it's much more about being very deliberate about when when you have to use different skill sets. One of the things about product people, especially ones who kind of have have been sort of in the business, so to speak, for a while, is that there is a context switching that happens almost every day, uh, multiple times a day. And if you just take take that thinking like, yeah, you, you can go really far in one context and you apply that to every single thing that you see. So, you know, uh, earlier earlier today, uh, Carlos asked me, hey, what do you think of this little tool that we're using for this video stuff? And I, I had to kind of stop myself because I went straight into product feedback mode, which I usually don't get into and started thinking about, well, this is my experience. I'm the user. 
this is what I like, this is what I don't like. And then I had to stop myself. And then we talked about uh, the background color of the tool that, that's being used and all that stuff. So to me, that's, I don't want to say that's too much product, but like, I didn't need to do that. I didn't need to turn that on and start giving feedback. So I caught myself. So I think there is a sort of thing I see in people where if you're repeatedly doing it, that's kind of your approach to everything. And I, even being a product person, die hard, I, I got to say that that's not always... Um, the best thing. I'll give one last example uh, of this. And, and that example is a classic one everyone's probably super familiar with. It's basically this idea when you're talking to somebody and telling them your problems and they start offering you solutions when you didn't want the solution, you just wanted them to listen. So that's a classic example for me, like a product person to keep trying to offer the, the solution, but the person just wanted you to hear them and nothing else. <laughs> so uh, that, that's kind of what came to mind for me. Absolutely. Anybody else? I'll offer my thoughts. I actually love when product is responsible for driving business forward because it makes them think really hard how to prioritize different features versus scale work versus innovation work because they are accountable for delivering business value back to the company. I hate it when only sales team have revenue goals or only marketing teams have revenue goals, but product does not own or accountable or responsible responsible in the revenue goals, at least be shared. I appreciate that it's really hard as a product manager to know how that you're not fully responsible for making money, like marketing and sales has to plug in somewhere. But when product is completely out of that picture, I think it can be really negative because product then focuses on cool things or infrastructure things, which can be very problematic because they're actually not delivering value to the customer that you can exchange through monetization and delivering revenue to your business. But if you drive accountability to product and you say product, you co-own the revenue number with me and your bonuses will get hit, your hiring plans are dependent on it and whether or not we're hitting our business goals, then there is no such thing as being too much product focused because all product is gonna wanna do is to deliver value to the customers so you can exchange it through the revenue capture. But that connection to me is what really makes it or breaks it because if you develop, let's say 75% of your budget to R&D, research and development, and then you keep them completely unaccountable for business goals, yes, you can be too product focused and not necessarily deliver on any of your revenue. So that shared mentality and accountability is so important. Never just push it off to marketing, never just push it off to sale. It has to be all the triage of them that are responsible of delivering business value back to the company and to your customer as well. Uh, we have some amazing questions. We have 15 minutes. If you guys uh, have any questions too, please uh, add them to Slido, but I'm gonna go through some of them. We have an interesting one. So can you talk a bit about product teams that are B2B2C? So they're selling to businesses that are then selling to consumers. So no direct access to users. So, or it's a completely white labeled products. Can you be a product-led growth company then when you don't have users that you're working with? Vicky, what do you think? I, I go back to the the uh, what we talked about a little bit earlier, where is there a foot in the door you can get with those consumers where you kind of get in and uh, start to it kind of grows organically within the organization till you get to the buyer now that might not be possible in all circumstances but i think that mentality to think about how do we get value in front of uh the c part of the equation so that by the time you have to make a purchasing decision um that you know there's there's true value that the organization is getting um so that's kind of how i would like turn the question back is is it truly not an option or is it just the traditional path to go b to b to c Yeah, yeah, to me, is. it's um, a little bit kind of an, as an excuse because the reality is that there is always a user. It's not like you are selling to a vending machine, right? That is going to give you something. Uh, if you are selling a B2B product, there are users of that product. True that maybe the, 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 one, the person who buys that product is not the end user, but you truly need to effort to, to understand both the user and the decision maker. So it does it to me, if you really want to apply this concept of caring about your customers, 
it doesn't matter if it's a B2C product, B2B, B2B2C, government or not. It's just do the homework and really understand who cares about it and how you can solve their problem. I would actually go even one step further. I, I when Let me just bring it down to a little bit more of a B2B potentially, but B2B, you're selling usually to an enterprise buyer. And then that enterprise buyer takes your software and they propagate it to the users. And yes, you do have access to the users, that's fair. So that's because that's the product they're interacting, but you still need to sell it to the enterprise buyer in order to even get access to those users. And your North Star metric should be usage by the C's not necessarily the sales by the bees. So not the businesses, but the consumers. I'll bring it down to an actual example, SurveyMonkey. SurveyMonkey is all about creating surveys, creating online surveys. That's awesome. But the North Star metric for the company was actually respondents because those are the people that actually delivered value to the creators, which is why creators would engage with SurveyMonkey. So it was never about optimizing and growing creators. We needed to grow number of respondents because that not not only started our content loops for the company overall, and they created a lot of amazing branding exposure, but even though those were not truly consumers because they were just respondents to the survey, that's who we optimized for. That's who we actually wanted to grow because more respondents we had, the better our business was overall because creators were becoming, there was more brand awareness. That's where the actual value to creators came into play. So even though you might not think about, okay, it's B2B to B to C, you, your C's in there actually have to be your North Star metric in a way, because that's the only reason those B's will even interact with you. So thinking about it as not necessarily who's driving your monetization and who's paying, but who's actually creating the value for the customer that is actually paying is extremely important. And uh, it changes a lot of a bit of the thinking on your side, but but um, then it creates a sustainable framework for your business uh, going forward. Okay, I am gonna move into the next question. Um, so we have a pretty good upload here. How do you see the relationship between product managers and designers? In other words, designers are trained to put customer users first and facilitate the co-design process. So who's leading it, product? managers or designers? How do the two actually working together? Vicky? Very okay. good. I can. Okay, go ahead, please. Okay, Carlos, yeah, please go ahead. I'm going to wear my teacher hat here from product school. Uh, so I'm going to make an, an, a stand here. I think we need more designers moving into product. I think design is extremely underrated. Traditionally, we've had a lot of engineers that became PMs and also business people. And design used to be that hybrid role there that it seems to be like, okay, an afterthought. I think design is absolutely strategic and everyone who wants to be a manager or a product manager needs to understand design to a certain degree. So if you don't come from a design background, I think it's time to catch up and really understand the fundamentals to be appealing to user. And again, I don't want this to apply just to a B2C context. I think B2B or B2G, is the new B2C because everything is a C at the end of the day, to your point, Irina. Anybody else? Any Anything to add? Um, yeah, I, 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 I tend to agree with Carlos. Um, and I, I don't think it just applies to B2C, but I, I wanna share one interesting thing, which is what is design? Like that's the piece where many years ago, when I first started building software, I knew what design was. I knew what they did. Today, I don't exactly know what they do just because they have a title designer or designer in the title or even user experience in the title. I have to go talk to them and be like, what do you do? What do you like doing? What do you wanna be doing? And then we figure out, okay, how does that fit into our product development process? That's at least how we do it because over the years, we've noticed that that word designer could mean three or four different things. And then now when you start adding React and all these different frameworks uh, uh, that are beyond jQuery or any of those basics, you kind of start wondering like, what, who is a designer? What is a designer? What are they actually going to do? Because the job is basically split up into like five different jobs from when I used to remember it. I used to remember a time when you, someone would use Photoshop 
they would code up the front end of it and they would implement it with jQuery and all that the, the uh, sort of backend engineers would have to do is kind of Ruby or Python or whatever's in the backend and it all just works. And you could do stuff pretty fast back then like that. That's not the case anymore. That's usually a process that takes two or three people at least, not just one. And I think that that's, that's the challenge that I've found over time. Uh, the role has just evolved quite a bit and it's split up a lot more than ever before. Haven't they all though? I feel like marketers roles have evolved. Um, uh, engineering role has evolved in so many ways. So designer is definitely uh, one of them. And I, I always think about um, creating pods pods where there is a mini CEO, it can be designer in Apple, for example, designers set the roadmap, designers rule the real world. They don't have product managers, they have program managers that are product managers, because designer to design first company, because that's actually their differentiator. And that's their go to market strategy. So it's fascinating to see like, if you think about that pod between product manager, designer, engineer, QA, marketing, sales, um, data analyst, growth, um, growth PM and like who is the owner of that pod? Who is the mini CEO with the neck and, and, and why is that the CEO? And in a product led growth companies, product manager is usually uh, the pod owner because they are fundamentally focused on driving product strategy to solve for product needs. But it's not always the case. It's super fascinating to see when there's different owners of the pod outside of the product managers. And it's all about the really the concept of your company and what your go to market strategy is. Again, Apple being one of the best examples and most interesting ones. Uh, Vicky, I'm going to pick on you on this question because you already mentioned a little bit about curiosity here, but what are some tools and tactics for driving a problem solving or problem first mindset when your company is resistant or when your company is very has a knee jerk reaction to do solutioning first? I've been so many times in the room with the CEO that the moment they see a problem, they just go into solutioning without even truly aligning of what the problem is. So do you have any tips or tricks that you use to to really pull back and say, let's figure out what we're actually optimizing for first. Yeah, I mean, I think it starts with that question uh, that you just said is what are we optimizing for? I think there's there's kind of two things. There's one is what does success look like for this project, right? And to anchor that in a customer outcome. So it's not like adoption of feature X is success. That would, I think that, so I guess push back against that. The, the outcome should be, or the success metric should really be around a customer outcome. Um, so that's number one. Number two, I think key questions uh, is what are we trying to learn? Right. So with this work we're doing, here's here's the problem, at least like here's a sentence of the problem uh, that we think we need to solve. And before we even throw out how do we solve that problem, what question, what like what do we need to learn with this first solution we might put out? And I, I get that it starts with baby steps, right? Like it might be hard to convince an organization that's like really feature and solution oriented to take that time and take a step back. But I think if you can carve out a project or two and kind of show the value of going through this uh, process, um, that, that could be a good kind of just way to demonstrate through the work uh, of how, you know, uh, you might spend more time up front, but you have a better chance of getting it right when you've actually put in the investment. There's nothing like more excruciating than spending six months building out this big, huge, you know, starting with scale, building out this uh, huge project, launching it, and then, you know, getting crickets. Um, and so I think if you've been burned by that before, like using that as an uh, opportunity to say, hey, maybe we try a different approach where we um, really spend that upfront time understanding the problem and the user and what we're trying to learn uh, before we get into that deep implementation work. Uh, you you might have success, but it probably won't, like the whole organization might not change at once. So can you just find little pockets to demonstrate the, the value of it would be my advice. What are you optimizing for and what do we want to learn? Those are the probably the most important questions. Carlos on Hitton, do you have any other questions that you always try to ask in order to drive that curiosity? I do. Uh, my, my main question is how can we do this faster? without anyone pulling all-nighters. Without anyone pulling all-nighters, I have to put the caveat, not with my team, but here. Uh, my team already knows nobody pulls all-nighters. So we don't have that culture. Um, so yeah, I think that's a big question I, I, I will always ask. 
yeah, to just kind of piggyback off that, I would say how do we, to piggyback off what Hinge just said is how do we learn faster, right? So how do we, uh, like, what's the quickest way to learn the thing we're trying to learn? That's why I think that learn question is so important is because there's many ways you can learn an answer to a question. It doesn't always mean build the full feature thing that you think you need. So that's why I really love the framing of that question. I have a slightly different spin on it. I actually go even deeper and I say, what can we learn in the next seven days? I time box it because it's not about what can we learn and how fast we can learn. I want new data point in the next seven days. It can be a very small data point, but I want to make incremental progress because it's not about just solving the problem. It's about incrementality and every single day, every single week, getting a little bit closer to your optimal solution. And in the meantime, you're collecting the evidence to have a better hypothesis. So when you actually do develop a solution, you have all of the evidence in front of you to make the best choice and the makes best decision. So seven days, time box it. What can we learn in seven days of whether our hypothesis on how to solve this is even correct? Obviously, after you know what you're optimizing for to begin with. Well, we are at time here. Thank you, everyone, so much for joining our session. And thank you, our incredible uh, featured guests uh, for such an amazing discussion. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Hitton. Thank you for great questions from the audience. Hopefully, you guys found this useful. Remember, this is being recorded and it will be distributed later. And this is the last session for live event and our incredible Miro hosts will tell you what's up next for the rest of the day. Otherwise, have a wonderful day, have a wonderful night, and hopefully I'll see you around. Have a good one. Thanks, everyone. Hi, everyone.